Welcome to Health Talk. Today we're going to talk about what is high blood pressure. With us today we have Dr. Mary Rithuvarki, Olivia Whiting, Shannon Liu. So there have been some changes about what is defined as what blood pressure and what is high blood pressure. So tell us the new findings. Yes, that's right, Dr. Wu. Uh, there has been a change recently in 2017. Uh, it's called the Joint National Committee, where, they, where both the ACC, the American College of Cardiology, and the American Heart Association, they have revised the guidelines for what high blood pressure is. Previously, we used to think 140, 90 was high blood pressure. But so 140 systolic, the top number, number and, 90. and the bottom number, 90. 90. But now, 120, less than 120, 90 is considered as being normal, and anything above 120 over 80 is considered to be on the higher side of blood pressure. So the guidelines go like this, less than 120 the top number and less than 80 the bottom number is normal, which is, which is being normal. And there is something called as elevated where the top number goes from 120 to 129 and the bottom number be le being less than 80. And then there's stage 1 where the top number goes from 130 to 139 and the bottom number goes from 80 to 89. And stage 4, four is called classic high blood pressure, which is stage 2 which is less than more than uh, 140, the top number, and the bottom number being more than 90. So what previously was thought to be 140 over 90 is mm -hmm. now stage 2. Stage, yeah, stage 2. Yeah, so that means you have it. So in changing it to so the top number less than 120 mm -hmm. and the bottom number less than 80, that means 100 million more Americans have high blood yes. pressure. So that means we have like 34% of the U.S. population as having hypertension. So that's the latest uh, news. Mm -hmm. And that means that go see your primary care doctor immediately or check it yourself. Um, there have been lots of issues about high blood pressure, you know, mobile apps, what to do about it and the definition of it. And as I understand, both of you are involved in a study about high blood pressure and uh, tell us a little bit about that, Olivia. Yeah, we conducted a study. Um, there are about 700 participants. We went around taking demographic information, uh, gender, where the where the people were from, um, and we found out that um, actually Shannon knows a little bit more about the beginning of um, how yeah. the methods of the survey. So I'll let her talk a little um, bit more about that. So but. we asked questions like, "What is high blood pressure?" and we found that only 14% of the 700 knew that high blood pressure is at least 120 over 80. And um, what other questions do we ask? Yeah, we asked several other questions um, about whether or not that person had high blood pressure, how they were monitoring it, were they taking their blood pressure at home, were they using any mobile apps um, to manage that, and um, yeah. so we found some interesting results, yeah. Um, the reason why we asked about mobile apps is because more and more people are starting to rely on mobile apps to monitor their blood pressure. So we looked at um, the top 15 most downloaded mobile apps for hypertension. And um, we looked whether or not they indicated that um, normal was below 120 over 80. And they all had hypertension logs, but only three of the 15 had indications of a nor normal blood pressure range. And we so also- So nobody said on the apps there's no uh, disclosure saying, by the way, normal is. Yeah, right. So they don't have anything to compare their blood pressure to. They don't know if they're deviating or not. And we also look to see if those apps included factors you can monitor to reduce your blood pressure. So um, those factors include like alcohol consumption, exercise, BMI, um, sodium intake, and um, what did we find? for the results? We found for that that they're really out of the 15 apps that we analyzed, there was no app that uh, was inclusive of all of these other factors that are such high risk factors for um, high blood pressure. So we, in an ideal world, we would create an app that had so all of these other categories for patients to fill out and really keep track over time of things like sodium intake, potassium, alcohol consumption, because all of these things can be risk factors for them. Also, I looked yesterday at some of these apps and none of them looked at cross-cultural issues. Like, for example, they're not in multiple languages, you can't click, and then uh, they don't take into account to give them sort of warning things like certain foods are bad, like mm -hmm. you can't like eat butter and all this other stuff, or 
or have general kind of warning labels. So there's a, a kind of a disconnect still with the e-health mobile um, app uh, world and the patient needs and what the doctor needs are because even though we're trying to help them with the mobile apps, we aren't really there yet. We have just simple kind of blood pressure logs. Right. Most of the apps weren't in compliance with the ACC guidelines of um, telling a patient what their high blood pressure is and, and whether or not they're in a healthy range. So it's also an issue. Also, the reason why they changed the guidelines is that they wanted the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology wanted to decrease the rate of stroke in America. And if people have uh, in their minds that normal is 140 over 90, they might think 150 over 85 yeah. is good. And then that really isn't good. So to have people be aware that the cutoff is really 120 over 80 makes people work harder towards a goal mm -hmm. and that not only uh, settle for 150 over yeah. and 80. And not only that, like being less than 120, 80 will also help in the, like there is a stroke is a major com complication of high blood pressure. So we have a lot of cases of stroke nowadays and people uh, maintaining their blood pressure less than 120, 80 will help them preventing in early strokes. So in that case, the damage or the deficit will be less for the patient. Correct, yeah. Now, the stroke guidelines are now in the American Heart Association mm -hmm. website, and they have an acronym, mm -hmm. um, FAST. So tell mm -hmm. us about that. Yeah, FAST is an acronym um, that it, it's posted in hospitals and things like that, so any member of the public would be able to know exactly what to do at the drop of a hat if they were in an, an, an emergency situation. Um, so F stands for facial drooping. You want to look for that in a patient that might be having a stroke. Um, a stands for arm or leg. You'll have weakness, numbness on one side. Um, S is slurring of speech, um, so that can happen often as well. And T is, stands for time to call 911. So that's so, the acronym yeah. people can follow. Yeah, so that's really important. So if you are <coughs> at a barbecue and it's hot and it's humid and somebody collapses and you see that there's a facial droop, asymm asymmetry of the face, and that their leg is not moving or their arm is not moving, and that they can't even speak correctly or even mumble. So then call 911, don't wait. And as an ophthalmologist, one of the things is they can also have vision problems. Like they could see half the room becoming blurry and then it come back in 10 minutes as normal and that is called a transient ischemic attack. So that's a little brain attack, and it comes back. People ignore it until it comes again and again, and it becomes permanent, and then they have the facial droop and the arm weakness, and then they have a, a much more severe stroke. Mm -hmm. So high blood pressure plays a role in that. Mm -hmm. And in addition, high blood pressure affects your kidneys. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. Yeah, high blood pressure is... One, it affects the kidneys by if you have a hypertensive for almost like 10 years now and in a progressively the kidneys get damaged. How it happens is they have a, the kidneys actually try to filter out you know all the impurities from the organ, it's organ patient's body. So the the rate the the rate at which the kidneys filter that actually reduces over a period of time because of the high blood pressure and the arteries which supply the kidneys also kind of get constricted because of the high blood pressure because you have to pump against that pressure. So, so we should go back to the definition of high blood pressure. Yeah. So the first number the top number, which is like 120 over 80, that is systolic. Yeah. Systolic means, tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, systolic means is the pressure in the arteries, or the main, the major arteries in the in the heart. So that is the the pressure on those arteries are called as the systolic blood pressure. And if you see, the heart pumps in two cycles. It's called the systolic cycle and the diastolic cycle. Systolic is nothing but the heart is trying to pump the blood to all the rest of the system, the entire body. And diastolic is when the heart is trying to fill for the next systolic cycle. So the pressure in the arteries when the heart is trying to fill is called as the diastolic or the lower number, which we look for. So the systolic pressure, if, if you have a high number, that means there, there's a pressure gradient, more resistance in going, all the blood coming from your heart, going to your brain, filling the whole cycle from the brain to the head of the top, to, the, to your toes, that whole cycle. So it's squishing harder and harder this blood column to go through. And in 
against this greater resistance, little plaques may fall off, little emboli, and that can cause strokes, can cause eye disease, can clot up your carotid arteries. And then what happens is that um, over time, let's say you start off as a normal human being with normal blood pressure, but you eat chocolate bonbons and eat gobs and gobs of butter and cream and you just smother yourself in cholesterol, you get plaques, you get cholesterol mm -hmm. uh, laying on your arteries. And what happens is that that causes a constriction to the size of the artery and that increases the top number, the systolic number. So then this whole cycle then goes to every organ. Mm -hmm. So you get uh, end organ uh, changes in the heart. So if you're constantly pressing all this blood through higher and higher, greater resistance, your heart has to pump harder. Your heart in pumping harder gets in, makes a bigger, fatter heart muscle, which is called hypertrophy of your left ventricle. So over time, the heart gets, tries to get this fatter muscle in the heart to go pump, 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 and then it still can't do it. Mm -hmm. And then you get problems. Yeah, it's you, called the ejection fraction, which finally reduces because you're having a huge heart muscle and it's pumping. So finally it becomes low and that's when you end up with heart failure. So then your, that's what heart failure happens is then your heart can no longer pump even though it's really muscular. It's like having Arnold Schwarzenegger as your heart, being a bodybuilder in your heart, but it's not efficient. Yeah. And then the heart breaks down mm -hmm. and then you need uh, defibrillators and heart transplants, etc. So we don't want our home audience to think about that. We want them to think, what is high blood pressure? Let's stop it at the beginning. Yes. There are issues with high blood pressure because sometimes the pills come in many doses, mm -hmm. like once a day, twice a day, three times a day, and it's confusing. There are also different classes of yes. compounds, so tell us. So, so one class will be because of, it's called the arterial construction, calcium channel blockers are there, then we have diuretics, so then we have arteriolar dilators, so there are different class of medications which use, and then there are channels, uh, medications which target, you know, the, the pumping of the heart, like the beta blockers, which we call. So all these medications have a different form of action, and they're all targeting high blood pressure. So sometimes the patient can be on just single medications. For instance, if they are recently diagnosed with high blood pressure, the, the doctor might put them on just one medication. So as, and then the, they, as a result, when they, as time goes on, sometimes the blood pressure is not controlled with just one medication, so they need to add another medication and another medication. So there's a lot for the patient to do as well for high blood pressure is concerned. That's why we have the stock here to educate the public, general public, about how, you know, controlling your diet, exercising regularly, all those things are also a major factor in maintaining your blood pressure. So as an internal medicine doctor, what is your first line in somebody with simple hypertension? They're yes. 40 years old, yeah. they have 130 over 80, so yeah. what do you usually... So we usually tell that with one value we cannot uh, define them as being high, hypertensive or having high blood pressure, they need to take at least two or three readings. Sometimes some patients will be very anxious when they go to a doctor and usually they have high pressure when the doctor's office, it's called white coat hypertension. Most of the patients say that they're anxious seeing the doctor and so the high the pressure is going up. So they have to check the pressure when they are at home, different settings. And if it is like two consecutive values or three consecutive values are repetitively high in different settings, and that's when you usually diagnose a patient with high, high blood pressure or hypertension. And initially, the patient, we don't put them, sometimes if it's continuously high, then we put them on medication, but we start them with advising on their diet. We go back and ask them what their diet pattern is likely, what they eat on a regular basis, and trying to modify that. And exercising regularly would be a great step for them because it can be the weight and it can be the diet, and maybe they have a cholesterol. Sometimes they have a comorbidity called as they may be diabetic too, which being high, having high sugar. So these are the factors which they should consider. Now, one of the issues about high blood pressure is that for Asians and South Asians and East Asians, there's something called the metabolic syndrome, and there are five risk factors. Yeah. High blood pressure, high triglycerides, 
Um, fasting blood glucose be, yeah. high. Yeah, fasting and the, glucose. The, che the hip circumference, the waist mm -hmm. to hip BMI. circumference. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the if 40 inches, greater than 40 inches for men, men for 35. waist, greater than 35 inches for women for waist. And so even if you have high blood pressure and it is treated, um, you could have one of these risk factors. And um, South Asians, with the same numbers as a Caucasian, has a 40% increase risk of stroke once mm -hmm. they have one of these five factors. So it's something to think about as uh, more people immigrate to America and more people visit America and they go to the emergency rooms um, as our demographics are changing, that these are things that we should consider, that these are um, added things that we must consider in just high blood pressure. And also high blood pressure is a major component of heart attacks. So we don't know how much a patient knows about heart attack and what the symptoms are about high, uh, you know, the cardiac arrest. Sometimes the patient might not know, like having chest pain, or sometimes the symptoms may be silent in diabetics. So patients might be, need to be aware of that. Like. So in that survey study, what surprised you the most? That 14% knew what it was, even though this was November 2017, the news? What else? Um, I think it's surprising that um, people are not updating themselves on um, the revision of um, blood pressure and that's really mm -hmm. important because they need to take the preventative measures for it before it getting worse and worse and because once you get hypertension you're forever hypertensive yeah. so yeah also I think that it depends Perhaps it's also the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, they have not done enough outreach, or they yeah. feel that they've done the outreach to the primary care doctors, and then the primary care doctors are simply overwhelmed yeah. by the many millions of patients they see per year, and that they are not able to tell them that this is the latest change. Um, and sometimes it's as all the office medical visits have increased with the Affordable Care Act. Um, everybody who is in primary care has experienced a lot of patients coming mm -hmm. with diseases and it's hard to tell them everything all at once in that first visit. And patient yeah. education is it's important, is important, difficult to attain sometimes in a multicultural mm -hmm. society where people speak yeah. many different languages. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think that one of the other things that was important that I thought was interesting that a hundred million more people are going to be diagnosed mm -hmm. and that the outreach must be even more. We must try harder or the app makers must somehow put it in their apps mm -hmm. that, by the way, the latest guidelines are, you know, a little banner that runs through. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't reached that point in even Silicon Valley where this is being taped. Uh, so tell me what other concerns there are. Let's say I'm a 40-year-old person with hypertension 130 over 80, and I did not lose the weight in the next three-month visit. I'm still chubby. And uh, then do you start with beta blocker or what? Depends on what, what they have. We do a lot of blood, blood workup, the electrolytes, and before checking. Sometimes people can be just hypertensive on just one setting, and so we don't start them on medications immediately. So we look for their progress over a period of three months or six months and see how they go on. And if they still continue to have high blood pressure, then we might start them on a small calcium channel blocker or sometimes a small dose of diuretic and then see how they are. It depends. Each for each patient, it varies, and so we don't start them on medications, all three medications immediately. We, we in slowly, slowly taper the, and increase the dose. So with the calcium channel blockers, what are the, like the top two most common? Um, there are a lot of new medications which come, and sometimes the calcium channel blockers have some side effects too. Some, sometimes they cause edema of the feet, which is the swelling of the feet. So sometimes they don't, it's always the patient preference. We tell them what the medications are, and then sometimes the patient says, oh, I'm not, uh, you know, that medication is not good for me, so we have to change the medication. So then many of my patients are on diuretics, like yeah. hydrochlorothiazide, which is an mm -hmm. old one. So that causes people to go to the bathroom a lot, yeah. to urinate. Mm -hmm. Some people don't like that yeah. either. Uh, so all of them come with something. So it's important to go to your pharmacist, mm -hmm. talk to them. And if you're on many medications, you can now request your own pharmacist. Yeah. And 
always make a list of the medications mm -hmm. and carry it with you to every doctor so that every doctor knows. For example, as an ophthalmologist, a retina person, we realize that if you're on a beta blocker, we may not add another one. We may no. not add Timoptic or Timolol, which is a beta blocker for glaucoma. And we also always take pulse in our uh, exam to make sure that if they are on a beta blocker and we add something else, we don't want to lower mm -hmm. their systemic blood pressure and have them collapse and faint as they're putting their glaucoma drops. So all doctors need to know the whole list. Mm -hmm. So we encourage everyone to um, write down the list of medicines, to uh, take it to every doctor and put it, make a uh, photocopy your on your smartphone because your smartphone acts like a Xerox machine. You can take a picture yeah. of the list of medicines, take a picture of each of the little uh, capsules that you get from the druggist, the little pill bottle with the name. That helps all of us. Yeah, and for high blood pressure, usually the patient can maintain their own log. They can. Ch it's important that they buy a you know home machine of to check that it's available on all <coughs> the stores where they can buy their home you know, blood pressure monitoring device and they can check their blood pressure morning and evening and see and write it down in a piece of paper before they go and see the doctor. So the doctor is aware of how the blood pressure was trending over the last two weeks and monitor and or adjust the medications accordingly. I've also had patients bring in their own home monitor and check it against our office. And we found that some uh, cheap ones that are $20 don't work. So be careful. You get what you pay for. Make sure yeah, you it get is a very good. Get a good device. home device because if you get a cheap one, it's incorrect. Mm -hmm. In addition, the arm cuff has to fit correctly. If you're built like the 49ers, they have a very big bicep. Um, you need to get a cuff that's larger. And, and if you're super skinny, like the beautiful Vogue models, you need to get a smaller cuff. A, a smaller cuff. So you have to be aware of that when you buy these home devices mm -hmm. to check. And if they don't have that, don't buy it. Why get one that gives you the wrong reading? And then you tell your doctor, I'm fine, I'm fine. And meanwhile, yeah. you collapse, go to the ER with a stroke. So um, for our home audience, we should really go over certain things we think it's really important for high blood pressure. So the top number has to be less than 120. That's a systolic and the bottom number less than 80. That's the diastolic. So look for that and ask your doctor about the latest 2017 guidelines from the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. When they first came out, the New York Times had a bunch of editorials with complaints from the Academy of Family Practitioners, which they felt it was, they, the, the president of the Academy of Family Practice Practitioners felt that it was impossible to get them to that point. So uh, I hope we've evolved, that we come to a better agreement, mm -hmm. because obviously preventing stroke uh, for uh, America is very important. And the uh, acronym for stroke is FAST. Mm -hmm. and fast, which means you have to act fast. Yes. And that's an easy way to remember. Act fast, mm -hmm. yeah. Face, drooping, A for arm, tingling or not uh, working, not moving, or leg, appendage, not working, and S for slurred speech, and T, uh, time to call, 911. Uh, and the other thing for uh, chest pain. Yeah, they can have chest pain. Sometimes it can be just a mild pain. Sometimes it can be like spreading to the arm and it can also go to your neck, to your tongue. Some patients can have like nausea, vomiting. Some of them can have dizziness, palpitations. All these are the, you know, the symptoms to look for and when you have to go to the ER immediately. So usually it's arm pain yeah. um, on the left side. Left side. And, and if you're diabetic, you feel no, no pain. pain. Yeah. So they could just, uh, just have the nausea mm -hmm or they can just suddenly collapse. Some uneasiness. Or uneasiness. Some discomfort. Yeah. Uh, so you have to be careful when uh, you're hanging out at those summer barbecues and it's intergenerational. So the message for our take home audience, thank you for joining us. Remember the top number should be less than 120, the bottom number less than 80. And don't worry, you're among the new 100 million people if for with 
new high blood pressure because of these new guidelines because we want to help you. Thank you very much for joining us. If you like KSAR TV, please make a donation. Thank you again.